This is the online lecture slideshow for Philosophy 131, Learning Module 3. The subject is miracles. This is part two of two. Recall this issue. Rival miracle stories subvert one another. All miracle stories are based on the trustworthiness of witnesses, whom we know to be true believers, with whom others disagree. Even if we could trust that witnesses are sincere, not lying, the followers of one religion dismiss rival religious miracle stories as unreliable or incredible. This undermines the authority of their own miracle story witnesses. The miracle of Jesus' divine origin and birth from the Virgin Mary is widely rejected by people otherwise credulous about miracles concerning their own exalted persons. Muslims and Jews deny the Jesus miracles. Muslims consider the Quran, the Holy Book of Islam, as the Word of God and a miracle, but Jews and Christians do not. Islamic doctrine tells us that the prophet Muhammad split the moon. Also, he flew from Mecca to Jerusalem on a winged horse-like creature, and he visited Allah and heaven. Jews and Christians do not believe this, but these stories are also based on testimony by exalted persons. Here's David Hume from his Enquiry Concerning Human Understanding in 1748. It forms a strong presumption against all supernatural and miraculous relations, that they are observed chiefly to abound among ignorant and barbarous nations. Or, if a civilized people has ever given admission to any of them, that people will be found to have received them from ignorant and barbarous ancestors, who transmitted them with that inviolable sanction and authority which always attend received opinions. Hume doesn't say miracles are impossible. He thinks they are unlikely. Scottish philosopher David Hume is one of the most important critics of miracles as supernaturally caused events. He bases his argument somewhat on an argument by an Anglican bishop against the miracles of the Eucharist, or transubstantiation, which is where bread and wine during the Catholic Mass become literally the body and blood of Christ. Hume called miracles violations of laws of nature, and he calls miracle stories incredible because violations are so unlikely, given our experience. Also, testimony is flawed, highly subjective, and prone to bias. Plus, alternate explanations cannot be dismissed. Hume's guiding principle. If someone testifies that they have witnessed a miracle, then you must ask, which is more likely, that their testimony is a lie the result of a deception, a mistake, or exaggeration, or the truth, a real violation of the laws of nature has occurred. Here's David Hume on what a miracle is supposed to be. A miracle is a violation of the laws of nature, and as a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, the proof against a miracle from the very nature of the fact is as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. Why is it more probable that all men must die, that lead cannot of itself remain suspended in the air, that fire consumes wood and is ex extinguished by water, unless it be that these events are found agreeable to the laws of nature, and there is required a violation of these laws, or in other words, a miracle to prevent them? Nothing is esteemed a miracle if it ever happened in the common course of nature. It is no miracle that a man seemingly in good health should die on a sudden, because such a kind of death, though more unusual than any other, has yet been frequently observed to happen. But it is a miracle that a dead man should come to life, because there has never been observed in any age or country. There must therefore be a uniform experience against every miraculous event, otherwise the event would not merit that appellation. And as a uniform experience amounts to a proof, there is here a direct and full proof from the nature of the fact against the existence of any miracle. Nor can such a proof be destroyed or the miracle rendered credible, but by an opposite proof which is superior. Hume goes on. Sometimes an event may not in itself seem to be contrary to the laws of nature, and yet if it were real, it might, by reason of some circumstances, be denominated a miracle, because in fact it is contrary to these laws. Thus, if a person claiming a divine authority should command a sick person to be well, 
a healthful man to fall down dead, the clouds to pour rain, the winds to blow, in short, should order many natural events which immediately follow upon his command. These might justly be esteemed miracles, because they are really, in this case, contrary to the laws of nature. For if any suspicion remain that the events and command concurred by accident, there is no miracle, and no transgression of the laws of nature. If this suspicion be removed, there is evidently a miracle, and a transgression of these laws. Because nothing can be more contrary to nature than that the voice or command of a man should have such an influence. A miracle may be accurately defined, a transgression of a law of nature by a particular volition of the deity, or by the interposition of some invisible agent. A miracle may either be discoverable by men or not. This alters not its nature and essence. The raising of a house or ship into the air is a visible miracle. The raising of a feather when the wind blows wants ever so little of a force requisite for that purpose is as real a miracle, though not so sensible with regard to us. The Last Supper is the final meal that, in the Gospel accounts, Jesus shared with his apostles in Jerusalem before he was crucified. The Last Supper is commemorated by Christians in the Catholic Mass. Moreover, the Last Supper provides the scriptural basis for the Eucharist, or the sacrament of the Eucharist, also known as Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper. During this ritual, a miracle happens. Is Christ really present in the Eucharist? Following the command of Jesus himself to his disciples at the Last Supper, the priest raises the wafer of bread and says, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. Then he lifts a cup of wine. Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. This sharing is a means of communion between Jesus and his disciples. It's not merely metaphorical. If you think the bread and the wine in the Mass are symbolic, then you are some kind of Protestant. Early Christians were called cannibals because the ritual of Holy Communion required the eating of Christ's flesh and drinking of his blood. According to the doctrine of transubstantiation, this amazing but invisible change of substance actually happens during the celebration of the Catholic Mass. Lots of people don't believe this really happens because it contradicts what we observe about the bread and wine we see before us. We never see it become flesh and blood, so we doubt it. It's all very complicated and mysterious. For more, see the Wikipedia entry on the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Here's Archbishop of Canterbury, John Tillotson. Catholics believe that they verily eat and drink the natural flesh and blood of Christ. And what can any man do more unworthily towards a friend? How can he possibly use him more barbarously than to feast upon his living flesh and blood? This doctrine hath been the occasion of the most barbarous and bloody tragedies that ever were acted in the world. Christians have been murdered for the denial of it. Tillotson's Argument Against Transubstantiation John Tillotson attacks the idea of the real presence of Christ in the Mass. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury in the 1690s, the leader of the Church of England, which broke away from the Catholic Church during the Protestant Reformation in the 1530s. His writings were popular among American colonists. Okay, so what's transubstantiation? Transubstantiation is a real change in the substance of bread and wine into the actual body and blood of Christ during the sacrament of the Eucharist in the Catholic Mass, while our senses perceive no difference. Here's an outline of his argument. Evidence for the truth of transubstantiation is less reliable than the evidence of our senses against transubstantiation happening. Weaker evidence can never destroy stronger evidence. If evidence for transubstantiation is weaker than evidence against it, then we are not justified believing that transubstantiation happened. Therefore, we are not justified believing that transubstantiation happened. According to Tillotson, the miracle of the Eucharist strains credulity. If the Eucharist looks like bread, smells like bread, tastes like bread, 
than it is bread. Believing otherwise gives up the basis for all knowledge based on sense experience. Anything could be other than it appears to the senses. Our evidence for the truth of transubstantiation is less reliable than the evidence of our senses against it. His concern isn't about whether we can be certain that a miracle happens. Perhaps we can't be. Instead, it's about what is reasonable to believe. Shall we doubt what our senses tell us? Should we doubt also what other people perceive also? Tillotson's argument may also be generalized. This is what David Hume does. He's an empiricist. He accepts Tillotson's common sense Anglican argument against the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, and he applies it to miracle accounts in general. Hume applies Tillotson's reasoning to other miracles. The argument again, where we now substitute any miracle M for the specific miracle transubstantiation. Evidence for the truth of a miracle, M, is less reliable than the evidence of our senses against M happening. Weaker evidence can never destroy stronger evidence. If evidence for M is weaker than evidence against M, then we aren't justified believing that M happened. Therefore, we are not justified believing that M happened. Testimony establishes the truth of any miracle claim about an extraordinary event only when no better account of it is available. Here's Hume. No testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. So here's Hume's argument against accepting testimony as evidence of a miracle. A miracle claim is true if it describes a genuine, active God-produced violation of the observed natural order of events. If someone testifies that they have witnessed a miracle, then we must ask, which is more likely of these four possibilities? The testimony is a lie, a mistake, an error or misperception such as a hallucination or dream, a delusion, a false belief given to us by another or told to oneself, or true, that is, a genuine act of God miracle has happened. Experience tells us that lies, misperceptions, and delusions are more common, and simpler explanations of events attested to, and thus more likely than a miracle. This is Hume's test. Therefore, it is unreasonable for us to believe testimony that a miracle has occurred when a more probable alternative account exists. Given our experience, which is more likely, Hume says, a. Someone testifies that they have seen a miracle and they have not really seen a miracle. Or B. Someone testifies that they have seen a miracle and they actually have seen one. A is always more likely than B, according to Hume. What do skeptics like Hume want? Testimonial evidence in support of miracles needs to satisfy the following criteria. Number one, there's got to be lots of reliable witnesses. Number two, competent, educated observers. No hearsay, no secondhand stories. Three, eyewitnesses of integrity and good reputation. Number four, public occurrence of the miracle event. If it's private, we can't check it. Five, repeatable or subject to test, cross examination. But witness reliability is not the biggest problem. Miracles violate natural laws, that is, what we regularly observe among the natural order of things. Even if the sun went dark for eight days, starting on 1 January 1600, we would still look for natural causes. So this is Hume's advice. Believe the lesser miracle. Hume argues that it will always be more likely that miracle testimony is a delusion, a lie, or a deception, or a mistake, and not the result of a real violation of the natural order of things. He doesn't claim to know that no miracle occurred. Instead, he finds other explanations more probable. In sum, our experience supports the expected regularity of nature rather than confirms the rare irregularity. We should reject the greater miracle, those contrary to experience events, in favor of the lesser miracle, false testimony, however sincere. Hume's point is not that miracles are impossible. It is that genuine miracles are improbable, 
and other explanations are more probable. Does Hume presume what he needs to prove? Only if we are unfair to him. He and we seek reasons to believe too. He does not define miracles out of existence. If anybody, God could work a miracle. It is just that we must consider how likely any alleged miracle is, given the evidence. And there is so much prior contrary evidence against miracles that we end up never having a good reason to distrust our previous observations. Lewis Poyman has a nice outline of Hume's argument against belief in miracles. Again, this is not an argument against miracles, it's against believing in miracles. One ought to proportion one's belief to evidence. Sense perception is generally better than evidence. Start over. Lewis Poyman has an outline of Hume's argument against belief in miracles. Again, Hume's argument is not against the existence of miracles, it's against believing in miracles. Number one, one ought to proportion one's belief to evidence. Number two, sense perception is generally better evidence than testimony. Three, therefore, when there is a conflict between sense experience and testimony, one should accept what is based on sense experience more than what is not. Sense perception has not revealed any miracles to us, that is, any actual violation of nature's uniformity and regularity. 5. Every time we investigate an event, we find it has a natural cause. 6. If claims 3 through 5 are correct, then we are never justified believing in miracles, but we are justified in believing in natural causes of events. 7. Therefore, we are never justified in believing in miracles, but we are justified in believing in natural causes of events. Section 5. How do philosophers Richard Swinburne and John Mackey respond to David Hume's argument? Richard Swinburne thinks miracles are possible. Let's be really clear. Number one, can there be evidence that a law of nature has been violated? Swinburne says, yes. Number two, could there be evidence that the violation was due to a god? Swinburne says, yes. Swinburne makes a good point. Sometimes testimony is good evidence. Question, can there be evidence that a law of nature has been violated? Swinburne says, yes. For example, suppose the combined testimony about a specific alleged miracle is extensive and overwhelming. If 200 skeptical, honest, sober, well-informed witnesses say they saw an event, one they all acknowledge is a clear violation of natural law, and are able and willing to admit that the event did not occur if there were grounds for doing so, then we would have sufficient evidence of a natural law violation. Or, given this testimony, we would have evidence that what we thought was a natural law really isn't, or that it remains true in general, but that there are rare exceptions. Either way, such testimony serves as evidence. A law of nature is an exceptionless generalization well confirmed by data or lots of observations. We find no counter instances to it. Laws are called universal when we believe, based on our experience, that they are true throughout the universe everywhere, always. For example, virgins don't have babies and dead men do not rise. All of our experiences confirm this. A violation of a law of nature is any occurrence of a non-repeatable counter-instance to a law of nature. For example, a person levitating or walking on water, water turning into wine, or resurrections violate the natural order. So this is Swinburne's point. Miracles remain possible. The miracles cannot happen argument is a bad one. Here it is. If E is an event which is a miracle, then E violates natural law L. If L is a natural law, then E, the event, could not occur. Therefore, either the event did not occur or the event is not a miracle. So there's a problem with this argument. Number one is false, according to Swinburne. Why? 
Again, number one, if an event is a miracle, then that event violates natural law. Events that are miracles are possible, which do not violate natural laws. For instance, gods could conceivably produce miracles within the boundaries of laws of nature. We could recognize such events if we had overwhelming eyewitness evidence and no physical evidence. Miracles are possible even if they seem to violate laws of nature. If we really did witness a man levitating, contrary to what physics says, we might need to revise our physics. Swinburne thinks that such events would be non-repeatable counter-instances to laws of nature that require no formal modification of the laws. So these would be unique exceptions to the law. A law of nature does not make things happen. Instead, laws describe in general what we always observe happens. Suppose L is a law of nature. L is this. Water never turns into wine. This law, water never turns into wine, is supported by much experience and experiment. No exceptions have ever been observed. Now suppose that 200 credible people say that they see extraordinary event E, that is, water at a wedding feast in Cana turns to wine. This law predicts that that event does not occur. If the event actually happens, then that event violates that law. Violations mean we are wrong about the law actually being a law, or that the law has a rare exception, and so the law must be revised. In science, laws are framed, rejected, and revised due to observations. Therefore, we could have good reasons, observations, to believe that a law of nature has been violated. This is Swinburne's point. Let me say a little more about laws of nature. Laws in science are universal generalizations we use to describe and explain events. But it's a mistake to think of these as laws like our ethical or legal laws. Why? Unlike ethical and legal laws, which remain true even if they are broken, when one observes a violation of an alleged natural law, this means that the law is not true. For natural laws, one exception, any violation, proves that the law is false. Exceptions are devastating. In the moral and legal realm, laws can have some non-serious exceptions and still function as guidelines. Also, it's difficult to find an exception to a natural law, but it is even more difficult to prove an alleged natural law. We accept them since we find no exceptions. That's all. There could be exceptions. As soon as we see one, we'll give up the law. Even Newton's laws of motion have limits or are sometimes false. Newton's laws only hold for some frames of reference called Newtonian, or inertial reference frames. These only apply to objects of constant mass. Remember F equals ma, force equals mass times acceleration? This is Newton's second law. Acceleration is produced when a force acts on a mass. The greater the mass of the object being accelerated, the greater the amount of force needed to accelerate the object. But Variable mass systems like a moving rocket or a leaking bucket cannot be treated as a system of particles, and thus Newton's second law cannot be applied directly. So the law either is false or does not apply to some systems. Therefore, if the law is false, it's not a law. Or, if it does not apply to some systems, it is not general and thus not a law after all. Newton's second law is superseded by Einstein's theory of general, general relativity, but it continues to be used as an excellent approximation of the effects of gravity. Swinburne. Sometimes historical evidence overrides scientific evidence. There could be strong historical evidence for the occurrence of miracles. Lots of detailed, documented, consistent testimony from multiple different sources would support the claim that an event is physically possible, even if scientific evidence says otherwise. Even David Hume agrees. Here's Hume. There may possibly be miracles or violations of the usual course of nature, of such a kind as to admit of proof from human testimony. 
though perhaps it will be impossible to find any such in all the records of history. Thus, suppose all authors in all languages agree that from the first day of January 1600 there was a total darkness over the whole earth for eight days. Suppose that the tradition of this extraordinary event is still strong and lively among the people, that all travelers who return from foreign countries bring us accounts of the same tradition. So Hume's outlining what would count as a miracle. They are possible. Hume's issue, of course, is whether we should believe any occur. Swinburne. So memory, testimony, and physical evidence could sometimes outweigh the evidence of physical impossibility. It's just a question of how much evidence of the former kind we have and how reliable we can show it to have been. Swinburne thinks Hume's demands are excessive. Swinburne wonders whether Hume sets the standard of evidence too high. Remember, Hume concludes that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. But sometimes we do trust testimony in historical and scientific research. If laws of nature can be revised, then violations, real or imagined, are possible. Hume's view is not that miracles never occur. Instead, he thinks we can never have sufficient grounds for believing that a miracle has actually taken place. Circumstantial, scientific, physical evidence is best, but sometimes testimony is the only sort of evidence we have for many historical events. I think Swinburne is correct. It's possible that laws of nature have exceptions. This happens in science. Newton's laws of motion are examples of this. So it's possible that there are violations of laws of nature which could be miraculous. But this is not enough for us to believe in any miracles. Miracles, if they are real, still require the divine interventions or the action of a god. Swinburne. If God exists, then God could produce a miracle. So miracles are at least possible. Question. Could there be evidence that the violation was due to God? Yes. What evidence would prove that a God brought about the miracle? A. If you have independent evidence that a God exists, then you have possible compelling evidence that a given event is indeed a miracle. And B. If the occurrence of event E, which violates a natural law, is something only that God would wish to bring about, then we can reasonably hold the God responsible for the occurrence of that event, which would otherwise be unexplained. Here's Swinburne. The healing of a faithful blind Christian, contrary to the laws of nature, could reasonably be attributed to the God of the Christians. If there were other evidence for God's existence, whether or not the blind man or other Christians had ever prayed for that result. Given these two criteria, A and B, Swinburne concludes that we can have good reason to believe that a violation of a law of nature was caused by a god, and so was a miracle. But these are mighty big requirements to satisfy. Here's John Mackey from his article on Miracles and Testimony. Hume's case against miracles is an epistemological argument. It does not try to show that miracles never do happen, or never could happen but only that we never have good reasons for believing that they have happened. Assume that a miracle is any favorable, act of God, violation of the natural order. If anyone could alter the natural order, God could. We accept that. Also, just assume that miracles are possible. Why not? We sure can't prove they are impossible. So, when is it reasonable to accept that amazing, extraordinary, beneficial event E is a miracle? Answer, whenever both of these necessary conditions are satisfied, there are two, A and B. Condition A, we have proof that that event happened. No hearsay evidence allowed. Skeptics say, okay, an event happened, but it is possible that the event does not violate the natural order. That is, there are alternate explanations of these data. Condition B, we have proof that E is a miracle. That is, no natural or non-divine caused events allowed. Skeptics say, okay, if an event did happen, then it would violate the natural order, sure, but the evidence for the event happening is weak or lacking altogether. 
Mackey thinks that Hume's principle needs qualifying, it needs to be more specific. Recall, Hume's principle for the evaluation of testimony weigh the unlikelihood of the event reported against the unlikelihood that the witness is mistaken or dishonest. This principle follows from a more general principle. We should accept whatever hypothesis gives the best overall explanation of all available and relevant evidence. For example, hallucinations caused by cerebral anoxia explains near-death experiences, NDEs, better than supernatural accounts. Scientists induce and study near-death experiences just like those that revived patients report. Mackey adds that acceptance of any explanation is only provisional, temporary. Any decision about which of several rival hypotheses to accept is vulnerable to ad additional information, which could undermine the favored hypothesis. Even the best supported views remain insecure. The probability of any hypothesis always depends on some set of evidence. Sometimes what we reasonably believe to be a law of nature based on the evidence of previous experiences and our not ever seeing an exception might not actually be a law of nature. So violations of such laws are not impossible and not as unlikely as we might think. Still, we should be confident that human hearts will not restart after 48 hours of inactivity. John Mackey. Claimants must defeat reasonable doubts. Again, both of these conditions must be satisfied before we call an event a miracle. We need proof that the alleged event actually happened. We need reliable evidence. We also need proof that it's a miracle. So suppose it happens. You need to be able to show it could only be an act of God. There are practical problems with applying these principles. There are so many plausible alternatives to proof that it's a miracle. It might be something other than a miracle. It might not be an act of God. It might be a natural event. There are so many plausible alternatives to condition two that even if it's true that we can verify the event happened, even if it's true that condition one is satisfied, few would grant condition two that it's actually a miracle. And if we satisfy the condition for proof, if we prove that it's a miracle, prove that it could only be an act of God, then it becomes nearly impossible to satisfy condition one, the idea that proof of a miracle actually happened. So if it's really a miracle, it's really hard to show that it actually happened. The point, miracles are possible, but we just aren't rationally justified in believing in any because alternative explanations exist. Miracle talk overlooks alternate plausible explanations. Recall the classical miracles I mentioned earlier the creation of the universe, earth, life, humans. If there really are other planets suitable for life, and if multiverse theory is true, this lowers the improbability or the uniqueness of life for humans or intelligence in the cosmos. What about miracles in the time of Moses? The burning bush, for instance. That could be an hallucination due to heat exhaustion. How about a stick becoming a snake? Well, it could be a magic trick. Maybe it's a lie, the story. How about the death of children of the Egyptians, the plagues? Well, bacteria, viruses kill vulnerable infants but spare those with cautious parents. Plagues uh, are natural events. How about the parting of the Red Sea? Could be a low tide, dry season. This could be symbolic, not literal, this parting. What about Jesus of Nazareth and miracles surrounding him? His virgin birth, say. Perhaps his mother was an unwed mother, pregnant by Joseph or a Roman soldier. How about Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding feast? Well, maybe the partiers found hidden wine. What about the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes? People maybe brought their own food, found more food. How about Jesus walking on water? Well, there could have been ice. Uh, there could be a sandbar, a bank of sand. There could be a low tide. Sure, you're saying, uh, this is unlikely. Um, but which is more likely, a man walking on water or a man walking on a bank of sand? How about where Jesus cures the blind, the sick? These could be placebo effects. They might not actually be blind. Uh, it might be temporary, the 
blindness or the effect of the ability to see. It could be an exaggeration. It could be symbolic. How about the resurrections? Lazarus, Jesus. These might be false. They might be delusions. They could be lies told by conspiratorial zealots. Perhaps somebody stole the body. Uh, again, resurrections are often interpreted by theologians as symbolic, not literal. How about modern miracles? Say, healings at shrines, holy sites, and by mediators. Again, this could be the placebo effect. This is improbable, but not impossible. There could be spontaneous remission. Or perhaps conventional medicine worked. The effect is temporary. Maybe the healing really didn't work, didn't take. How about statues or paintings of, or sculptures that weep or bleed? All accounts are based on stories. They are unsubstantiated, perhaps faked. The church never allows any of these to be investigated. Well, how about apparitions or appearances of divine beings in nature, clouds, on walls, floors, windows, bagels? People are imaginative. This perhaps is wishful thinking. There are a couple of sorts of psychological phenomena that are at work. We see patterns or connections in random or meaningless data. This is called apophenia. Or pareidolia. This is the vague and random stimuli that get per misperceived as significant to people who are primed to expect appearances by divine beings. Our brains look for patterns in chaos. A satellite photo of Amaza in Cydonia, the famous face on Mars, explained this. Here's David Hume again. There is a universal tendency among mankind to conceive all beings like themselves and to transfer to every object those qualities with which they are familiarly acquainted and of which they are intimately conscious. We find human faces in the moon, armies in the clouds, and by a natural propensity, if not corrected by experience and reflection, ascribe malice or goodwill to everything that hurts or pleases us. Isn't this a miracle? Allah's name is written in the clouds. Here in Singapore, 2008, the monkey god appears in the trunk of a tree. In a freeway underpass appears Mary, the mother of Jesus. In a piece of toast, a burnt piece of toast, we see Jesus' face. One thing we have to be aware of are arguments based on a lack of evidence. This occurs when one assumes that a claim is probably true simply because there is no evidence or proof that it is false. But the most such reasoning shows is that a claim is possibly true. Many people reason this way in order to defend some of their favorite unsubstantiated beliefs. Here are some examples. Of course there is intelligent life in outer space. No one has ever, ever proven that there is not. Here the person is using the fact that you and I have no evidence against there being intelligent life as if that counts as evidence for intelligent life. Another example. Scientists have not proven that HIV can't be transmitted through casual, non-sexual contact. So, we should avoid casual contact with suspected HIV carriers. The argument is something like you can't even shake their hands because you risk HIV infection. Again, what was the evidence for this? The evidence for this is that scientists haven't proven that you can't get it that way. The reason scientists don't believe HIV can be transmitted by casual contact is that they've never seen it happen. Another example, it makes sense to believe what the Bible says about Jesus. Why? No one has produced a compelling reason to doubt early Christian accounts of Jesus being the Son of God or his miracles. Here, the idea is that we don't have a good reason to doubt it, so it must be true. And my personal favorite, you can't prove I'm wrong, so I'm right. So my inability to show you you're wrong. My inability to disprove what you say somehow functions as evidence that you must be right. That's a terrible argument. Now this reasoning mistake is called shifting the burden of proof, where we're taking the burden from ourselves, where we need to produce reasons for others to believe what we believe, and giving it to the other people and saying, you need to prove I'm wrong.
there are many versions of this, and there are two general kinds. Just select your favorite hypothesis, H, and try it yourself. You can't disprove H, therefore H is true. Or, you can't prove H, therefore H is not true. But what really follows from these claims? Think about it. If you can't disprove something, or you can't prove it, then you don't have a reason to believe any way, either way, anything about it. If, if H is your favorite claim, and you don't give us a reason to believe it, we remain skeptical. We won't believe it until you give us a reason. You don't have enough evidence to say H is true, and you don't have enough evidence to say H is false. So what should you do? You should suspend judgment. Doesn't mean H is true, doesn't mean it's false, it means you're waiting for more information, more evidence. Such reasoning doesn't convince us that Sasquatch exists, does it? You can't prove there isn't Bigfoot, so I, I think that's a reason to believe there is. For more on shifting the burden of proof, which is also called appealing to ignorance, see Gary Curtis' Fallacy Files entry here, www.fallacyfiles.org slash ignorant.html. Proof of a miracle by argument or observation is elusive, but still required. One cannot reasonably claim that miracles exist unless someone proves they do not exist. The burden of proof is always on the claimant who says that X exists, or that an extraordinary event E actually happened. It is not on the person who doubts it. Testifiers owe us evidence and argument. We can't explain E, therefore E must be a miracle presumes too much. If someone expects you to believe what they're telling you, simply because you can't prove they're wrong, they have shifted the burden of proof to you when the burden of proof rests with them. For instance, sometimes there are claims, let's call them positive claims, that are impossible to disprove. People say God answers prayer, or that Muhammad split the moon, or that Jesus loves child rapists too. Well, I don't know if anybody really says that, but if they did, and they said, you can't prove I'm wrong, I can't prove you're wrong, would that mean that they're right? This won't work. It isn't true that God answers prayer simply because I can't prove it's not true. Some negative claims are impossible to prove. Suppose someone says no ghosts or demons or leprechauns exist. Okay, how do you prove there aren't any of those? We might be able to prove they exist if we could see one and catch one. But this claim says there aren't any. Now, how could you prove there aren't? Again, this doesn't entitle anybody to believe there aren't. That is simply because somebody can't prove that there are. Muhammad did not fly from Mecca to Jerusalem on a winged horse, suppose someone says. Someone denies this story. Now, if they deny the story for lack of evidence, that's one thing. Perhaps that's acceptable. Without evidence, why would anybody believe that? But if their reasoning was that you can't prove this, again, you'd be committing the fallacy of shifting the burden of proof. The fact that I can't prove Muhammad did fly from Mecca to Jerusalem on a winged horse isn't enough reason for all of us to believe anybody to believe that he did not. Suppose somebody says, God is not great. How does one prove God is not great? How does one prove God is not anything? In fact, it's impossible to prove that God is not great. Again, an argument for believing that something is not the case can't be based on other people's inability to prove it is the case. So, who has the burden of proof? Does this sort of reasoning justify anything? I believe that miracles or whatever exist because there is no good argument or compelling evidence against their existence. Should we accept such reasoning ever? No. We already don't believe in fairies, vampires, and werewolves for lack of evidence. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, people say. Now, this is, this is true. But having no testable evidence, just logical possibility and a good story with lots of faithful followers is not going to be good enough. 
Maybe miracles occur. Miracles are not demonstrably impossible. This is Swinburne's point. But this is too weak to satisfy the burden of proof. Lots of as yet inexplicable and even supernatural phenomena are logically possible. Possibility is not the same thing as actuality. A possible lottery winner is completely different than an actual lottery winner. Believing in miracles can make people happy. You are perhaps free to believe whatever you wish. However, this does not make your, your belief true, even if it is what you or others want to believe. This is the end of Learning Module 3 Slideshow Part 2 of two parts on miracles.